Father, I pray that you'll allow us to just uh, still our minds and our thoughts so that we can just focus on you. We ask all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. It was the abbreviated form, but man, she put a lot of good stuff packed into two verses. That's, uh, um, 
Well, again, good morning. It's good to see everybody here. And uh, it, it was confirmed for those of you that might have been wondering, wondering about it. Uh, I had sent a message to a friend of mine that said, hey, at Grace Chapel, Global Methodist, we're having ugly Christmas sweater Sunday. What are you doing fun at your church? And she writes back, that's because their pastor is a nut job. So if you've been wondering, <laughs> yeah, but it is good to be here. I, I like to have fun. I mean, my favorite picture of Jesus is the laughing Jesus, and I've got a picture of it hanging in my office downstairs if you want to come see. I, I don't think Jesus was boring, and I don't think we should be boring either. So um, you know, we're thinking, I'm, I'm, my mind is wandering, I'm dressed like a pirate Sunday, I, I don't know, overall Sunday, I, we, we, have to, we have to do some fun things. Um, it, is, it is glad that everybody's here today, and also, man, if you think this place is beautiful right now, wait till tonight when it is darker and we're going to have our candlelight service and we're going to sing Silent Night and, and it's just going to be amazing, so please... Uh, Come back and join us for, uh, for our candlelight service at 5 o'clock. Um, it's going to be just kind of light and fun, and, and so um, that, will be, that will be good. I think that's everything. There's a couple of other little, little uh, meetings and things that you see in your bulletin here uh, that are coming up. There's an outreach meeting on January the 7th, uh, and then also on the 7th we'll be coming here and taking down the Christmas tree. And uh, we had a blast with that last time, so come and be a part of that. And, uh, and guys, we're going to need some muscle uh, so come and, and please help us with that. And then the Women of Grace will have a joint meeting on January the 9th. So it's good that you all kept my birthday sacred and had something before it and after it, but nothing on it. So thank you for that. I think that's everything. Anything we're missing? Uh, let me go ahead and invite our, our uh, or, where do you, Tracy, if you guys want to come on up. This is, again, one of my favorite parts of the whole season is when we get to light the Advent wreath. And uh, it's just such a special time of remembrance. And um, I know in a lot of the more liturgical churches, as we, we light the, uh, the white candle tonight, it's the, the Christ candle, and it's the bringing of Christ into the sanctuary. And that's just very special. So, This morning we light the candle of peace as we read Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon us, his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let us pray. Lord God, we light this candle of peace to thank you for your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the Prince of Peace. We who live in discord and strife have found peace in the promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name because he lives and reigns with you in your glory and in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I just get a kick out of that. I love it. Let's continue our worship as we return back to God, his tithes, and our offerings.
Okay, y'all know the question. Who saw Jesus? Amen. And I don't know if you noticed uh, Stella and Cooper walking out the door there. They are just so cute. Um, everybody else is too. I understand it completely. I have that effect on people. I either make them very restless or I put them to sleep. So, you know, you can, you can pick what direction you want to go. Uh, I, I love we can come and bring our, our prayers and, and our worries and our joys to a, a Father that hears us and loves us and cares for us. Uh, anything we'd like to bring forward this morning? Yes, ma'am. Prayer works. Prayer works. It's, it's, it's the most important thing we do here, quite honestly. Yes, ma'am. We, we have a, uh, just a phenomenal congregational care team uh, that looks after people, and um, if you'd like to be a, a part of that, um, you know, we, we welcome all the help we can get, and um, it makes a difference. It really does make a difference. Anything else? Yes. We'll throw in a shot of prayer with that too. So <laughs> that that's that's gotta help. Anything else? Amen. Amen. Okay. Yes. Congratulations. Wow. Amen. Let's take these and any unspoken we have to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, I I just I just can't I can't stop thanking you for all that you are and all that you do. Father, I, I, I thank you that, uh, that you are our Abba. Uh, you are a, a, a perfect, loving Father. Uh, Father, I, I thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, and the gift that he gave us as he died on the cross, the salvation that he provides for us if we just accept. Father, I thank you for your Holy Spirit, 
who lives within us and, and guides us and will speak to us your words, will bring us hope and, and peace. Uh, Father, I, I thank you that you loved us so much that you saw us down here and we were lost and confused and <coughs> you sent your son Jesus to, to help us. And he came to earth and he, he lived the life that we live. Uh, he suffered disappointments and he, uh, he just felt the things that we all feel. And that makes this, this night that we are celebrating even more special. Because something wonderful did happen and we thank you for that. Father, we lift up all of these concerns and these joys and uh, the celebrations and we thank you for those, and we, we place those concerns in your hand. And Father, why we, we ask for what we think is best, but ultimately we pray that your will be done. And so Father, I thank you for all these, especially the blessings. And we ask all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Any golfers in here? I know we do. Where are my golfers? What, you afraid to admit it? <laughs> I know we have some. Well, that's okay. I like golf. I don't understand it. Um, but I have a friend from the Air Force. He loves golf. And to make this short story even shorter, um, he was able to attend one of the most famous golf tournaments in all of history. Well, he told me that it was the Augusta National Golf Course. I don't know if that's Masters or what I, I said. I don't understand it. Oh, yeah, here it is. I've got it. I've got it written down. It was the 1996 Masters Golf Tournament and he could have witnessed one of the greatest moments of golf history. But he missed his chance, all because he decided to go buy a golf hat. Now, here's the deal. I don't know if you all remember this. After four days, Greg Norman was six shots ahead, and the guy in second place was Nick Faldo. Anybody remember that? Um, and in golf, you know, a six-shot lead is like a 30-point lead at halftime in a football game. It's, it's insurmountable, right? <clears throat> so my friend decides that his time could be better spent in the souvenir tent. So he, he wandered around the souvenir tent and he looked at the hats and he looked at the golf balls with, with all the cute logos on it and golf shirts. And, uh, but unbeknownst to him, history was happening just outside the tent. The greatest comeback in the history of the Masters was being staged. That six-shot lead became a five-shot lead, and then a four-shot lead, and then a three-shot lead, and then a two-shot lead. And by the time my friend stepped out of the tent, the players were neck and neck, and it was tied, with only a couple of holes to go. Faldo was charging. <coughs> Greg Norman was faltering. The crowds were, were surging. The excitement was building. And my friend was shopping. <laughs> so he ran as fast as he could to get to the 18th green to see who would win. But the crowds were just so thick. I mean, people upon people upon people. My, my friend was a little bit like Zacchaeus. Jumping up and down in the back of the crowds, trying to see, but he couldn't find a sycamore tree. So he missed it. Faldo made the putt, won the tournament, and my friend missed it. You know, it's one thing to miss history at a golf tournament. It's another thing to miss history in life. I mean, wouldn't it be sad to go through life in the souvenir tent and, and miss out on the big story. I mean, wouldn't it be sad to look back at the end of your life and think, well, you know, I've got the souvenirs, but I missed out on the big event. And that's what happened to the Bethlehem innkeeper. For whatever reason, he didn't open the door to Joseph and Mary. And as a result, the baby Jesus, who could have known his end, and, and he could have witnessed the moment, but he missed the moment. And because he did, we have these, these sad words in Scripture, uh, in Luke chapter 2. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. 
And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Now, we don't know much about this innkeeper. All we know is that for whatever reason, the innkeeper said, nope, we don't have room for you. So when the Son of God sought a place to rest, he was turned away. Why? Well, I I mean, I guess it's not hard to to hazard a few guesses, uh, the best of which is the one that Luke gives us, and it's this. The inn was full. It was just too full. Uh, Herod's census had turned that sleepy town of Bethlehem into a boom town. And this innkeeper, he, he knew a chance to make a quick buck when he saw it. So he squeezed a body into every bed and a person into every pantry. And he put rollaways in the hallways and he put cots in the kitchen. He, he did everything possible to, to give everyone a place to stay. You know, this was a, a once-in-a-lifetime economic opportunity. And man, I tell you what, he seized on it. But come on. I mean, she's pregnant. I mean, you, you can't find somebody who would give up their bed. I mean, just, just look at her. You can't find one person who will make room for her. Now, my hunch is that some of you would, wouldn't you? If, if somebody was just about to give birth to a baby, wouldn't you give up your bed? Which, which makes me wonder if there might not have been another reason that Jesus was turned away. You know, maybe the hour was just too late. I mean, the innkeeper had already blown out the last candle. The only sound was the popping of the fireplace and the snoring of the guest. And it was late. And the knock on the door, it, it was a midnight knock. When the innkeeper woke up and he, he went to the door, he opened the door and just enough to, to peer out into the darkness. He really didn't even care who was there, who he saw. He already knew what he was going to say. It's, it's just too late. Everybody's asleep. It's just too late. And, and besides, to be honest, the couple, man, they were just way too common. We're, we're not talking King Joseph here. Um, This isn't Queen Mary. Um, Had it been King Joseph and Queen Mary, and they had arrived on camels with an entourage instead of a donkey in dirty clothes, it might have made a difference. But since the hour was late, and the place was crowded, and they were just so common, he missed the opportunity, didn't he? The verse could have been written differently. It could have been written, Jesus was born in the inn. Instead, Jesus was born in a manger. What do you think you would have done had the inn been yours, had the knock on the door been your door? What do you think you... Well, no, let me ask it differently. What do you do? Jesus says, here I am. You know, here I am. And I stand and knock at the door. And if you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and I will eat with you and you with me. This is what Christmas is all about. The the Christmas invitation, no matter where you live, no matter how impoverished your town might be, how simple your life might feel, to every person, Jesus gives this Christmas. Christmas invitation. I'd love to come come in and be born inside of you. And so he knocks at the door and he knocks at the door and, and he knocks through acts of kindness. He, he knocks at the door through, through moments of mystery. He knocks at the door through the, the cry of a baby. He knocks at the door through the, the faithfulness of a friend. He knocks at the door, sometimes even through a sermon or a story. Maybe you sense him knocking at your door now. 
just like the innkeeper, you, you open it just a bit, and you look outside, and, and you go, oh, oh, my Lord, it's my Lord. Look who has come into my world. And you, you sense this warmness in your heart, and, and it's a bit mysterious, but it's an inner warmness in your heart. And you know, you're, you're just about to open up the door when, when the baby cries, or the boss calls, or the alarm goes off, or the beeper on your, your smartphone reminds you that you've got something you need to do. Study for homework. Take a test. Call the doctor. You've got to get to town. You're late for work. Got to go. Sorry. And you whisper to Jesus, I've just got to go. But thanks so much for coming by. But my life is too full. It's, it's crowded in here. Long lines and fax lines and, and babies and bills and demands. Is your life crowded? Here's what God wants you to know. If you think you live in a crowded life. And that's this. He knows. He, he knows. Heaven knows that life gets crowded. And it's this. When Jesus comes into your life, he does not come to complicate your already busy life. He, he comes to simplify your already busy life. I mean, think about it. The reason life gets crowded is because we try to do things that we were not made to do. And so often Jesus comes into your life, and here's the deal. He, he does not come with a list of things for you to do. He comes with a list of things he's already done. And he says, let's sit down here and talk. And let me show you this list of things that I've already done. Your sins, already forgiven. Your, your death, already defeated. Your fears, already removed. Your anxiety, already taken care of. Your lonely nights, I'm here with you. You see, the reason that life feels so crowded is because we tend to do what we're not created to do. We crowd our life with activity because we're trying to I don't know, deal with our past. And Jesus says, oh, I've already taken care of that. We crowd our lives with, with accomplishments because we're trying to impress somebody so that we'll feel good about ourselves. And Jesus says, I'm already impressed with you. And I'm the king of kings. You don't have to impress anybody anymore. And he comes not to complicate your life, but he comes to simplify your life. And he comes to to clarify your life. Life is busy, or life feels busy. Not for abundance of activity, but for lack of purpose. I mean, think about it. You know, life feels busy, not for abundance of activities, but for lack of purpose. And, and you and I both know people who have absolutely nothing to do all day long, and it exhausts them to do it. And they are exhausted not from activity, but from lack of purpose. You and I, we also know people who have more to do than is humanly possible. And, and yet they, they somehow tap into this inner source of, of, source of strength. And there is just this, this dance to their step and this smile on their face. And sure, they get tired just like we do. And they have to go to bed at night just like we do but they have a reason to get out of bed the next morning. That's what Jesus brings. Not the promise that you'll never need to go to bed, but the promise that, you know, I'll, I'll give you a reason to get out of bed every day, every day of your life. Look at this verse from the book of Ephesians. It says this, It's in Christ that we find out who we are, and what we are living for. Long before we first heard Christ and got our hopes and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us, had designs on us for glorious living. Part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and everyone. I know life is crowded. 
And Jesus comes not to make it more so, but to simplify it. Oh, but you know, it's, it's, just, it's just too late. No, it's not. You may feel like it's the midnight hour of your life, but Abraham was old, and God called him. Jacob cheated on his family. God called him. Moses was already retired, and God called him. Elijah was depressed, and God called him. Jonah, Jonah was on the run from God, and God called him. Peter cursed Christ. Saul persecuted Christ. Thomas, Thomas doubted Christ. And all three discovered that it's never too late for Christ. You know, and it's not too late for you. And here's the reason why. God loves you. That's it. God loves you. And there is something about you that he finds irresistible. Yeah, I don't know what it is either. But there's something about you that makes him say, man, I've just got to have that child in my kingdom. And I'll do whatever it takes to get him or her there. I want to tell you a story. This is a true story. It happened to a family in San Antonio. It's about a family that went on vacation. And while the parents were checking in, the SUV started to roll away with their three kids inside. And it was heading straight for a cliff. And the mother, trying to stop it, she put herself in front of the SUV before it reached the cliff. And the SUV ran over her. And as the vehicle bumped over her, it slowed down just enough for someone to jump in and pull the emergency brake just before they went over the cliff. But the mom, her name is Joy, her back was broken, and she is permanently in a wheelchair. But if you talk to her, she will tell you that she wouldn't change it for the world because her three kids are alive and with her. And I saw a video, and I've, I've got the link if you want me to email it to you. I saw a video of the family talking about how this incident had changed their life. And so this is the voice of Joy speaking here. She said this, This has completely changed my life and the life of our family. I remember as I was being run over, my life flashed before me, and right after I was run over, I was laying in the dirt. And it really dawned on me how I had really missed the boat in a lot of areas of my life. I had young children at the time, and I wanted them to get so ahead in life that every day after school we rushed here and there, rushing to this lesson and to that lesson. And it just hit me that I really missed it. I was wanting them to get ahead, but I was missing the true meaning of life and what God had planned for our life. And the next thing I remember, I was waking up in ICU with a bright light being shined in my face and a nurse and surgeon leaning over me and, say, and, I, and I said, will I ever walk again? And he said, no, honey, I'm afraid not. And I just, I just this is her, said, give me a chance. I'm, I'm begging for him to give me a chance. And he said, I can give you less than a 1% chance you'll ever walk again. And so she continues, and she said, I became very depressed, and I woke up a few hours later, and I felt like a part of me was dying, and I remember looking up and seeing these hands above me. And they were cupped, and Jesus spoke to me and said, I know what you're going through, and I'm here. I know the hurt you are feeling, but I still have you in the palm of my hands. I died for you on the cross so I can relate but you're in the palm of my hands, just know that. This is something tragic that has happened in your life, but we can bring good from it together. But you have to allow me to help you bring the good from it. And she said this, it, it wasn't an easy road, but I can say a lot of good has come from this. More good than bad, for sure. Isn't an astounding comment more good 
than bad has come from this. And her daughter Chloe said this, the biggest change in the three of us is our desire to show love to everyone around us each and every day. I remember the look on my mom's face right before she went under the car. And it was a look of terror and a look of panic. But it was also a look of complete determination. And it was in that moment I felt the depth of her love for me. It's completely boundless. And I took that feeling and I wanted to spread that feeling to everyone I could find in my life. Did you notice what Chloe said? When she saw the love in her mother's face, that, that the love she feels from her mother and her father, it changed her life. Love does that. Love changes our life. Would you let God love you today? I mean, did, didn't Jesus do for you what Joy did for her children? Through the manger and his life and his death, he placed himself between you and certain destruction. And he rescued you. He rescued you at the highest personal expense. <coughs> He felt in his body the punishment of our sins. He died the death that we should have died. Just because he loves you. He didn't have to, but he did. And today, if you honor him, if you receive that love, no excuses, no deflections, no shields. Just say, all right, Lord, I, I live in a crowded world, but I'm going to make space for you. I, I need you in my world. And, and maybe it's late. And maybe I've kept you at arm's length for a long time. But not now. Just let Jesus love you. We're going to end in prayer. A little different matter today. We're going to have some music playing in the background. And I would just ask you to sit there in your seat. Just close your eyes and just spend a few moments in the presence of Jesus. He's knocking at the door of your heart. So open it. Talk to him. Let him talk to you. So let me just ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Yes, Lord, thank you for coming into our world, for standing on our porch. Thank you for, for coming this far. We gladly open the door. Please come in.
Thank you, Father, that you would come into our lives. Thank you that you would come with, with a list of things that you have already done, that you died for us, that you've rescued us, that you, you come not to condemn us, but to love us and to protect us, that you come not to tell us that we don't matter, but that we do matter. Thank you, Father. Come. We throw the door open. We want to be welcomed at your table. Please come. Amen. The rest of this week, I've felt great, feel good now, no fever, no temperature, but I'm just going to hang up here and not be breathing in your air just, just for insurance purposes and I don't get sued. No, <laughs> every, every, everything's fine. So. May the grace and the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you now and forever. Amen.